57, 157, The Love of God. and turn with me, if you will, back to our text for the morning, Exodus chapter 3, a text whereby God reveals his name. We're going to see a very interesting verse today, the Lord willing, whereby God in a very special way is revealing his name here in Exodus 3. He tells us in another portion of text, which we'll look at, the Lord willing, this morning, that he had revealed his name in many other ways prior to this event here in Exodus chapter 3, 
And even though we find the name Yahweh, Jehovah, used prior to this point, God says he hadn't really revealed that name fully to his people until he brought them out of the land of Egypt. Rather interesting. They knew it in their head, but they didn't know it in their experience. And how often we know things about God without really knowing God, without understanding who he is as revealed by the incredible names which he has given to himself. These are not merely names that we call him. These are names that he has given to himself to reveal his character, to reveal his nature, to reveal his plan and his works, his sovereign counsels of eternity past, and his personal relationship with those whom he calls his children. Magnificent the way God has revealed himself. You look at the scriptures, you look at the names of God, and you very quickly discover that the God of scripture is not like the God of the pagans. The God of the pagans, the God of the false religions, have different names, and in some cases they have only one name. For example, in Islam, God is only Allah, and they say Allah Akbar, God is great. But there is no revelation of this God of Islam by his mercy and truth and love and compassion, only that he's powerful and you'd better be afraid of him. But the God of Scripture is not only a God who is a God of power, Yahweh Sabaoth, God Almighty or the Lord of hosts, but he's also a God of tender mercies and compassion. He's a God who is a father, a father who disciplines his children as well as loving them and providing for them. And his names reveal this to us. Last week we were looking at the different names that are given to God the Father. Names that are distinct from names that are given to God the Son as well. Some names of God apply both to Father and Son, and some apply distinctly to the Father. We saw his name, the Father of Glory, in Ephesians 1.17. We find our Lord Jesus Christ speaking of him as Abba, Father in Mark. We find Paul uses that name of God the Father in Romans 8, verse 15. We find that our Lord Jesus Christ calls him Heavenly Father, and we're told that this is how we are to address him in our prayers. In Matthew 6, Matthew 15, Matthew 18, Luke 11, he is spoken of as the Heavenly Father. We see that the book of Hebrews speaks of him as the Father of Spirits, Jesus, in his high priestly prayer, refers to him as righteous father. We find he is spoken of by James as the father of lights. Magnificent titles and names that are given to the father alone. We noted last week that there are over 300 titles or designations in the Bible which refer to the second person of the Trinity, our Lord Jesus Christ. We've covered a few of those will not be able to cover all of them. Then we noted that there are no specific names of the Holy Spirit revealed, though he is known by his descriptive titles. He is known as the Spirit of God 26 times. He's known as the Spirit of Christ two times. He's known as the Holy Spirit seven times. He's known as the Spirit 248 times. He's spoken of as the Comforter four times. He's spoken of as the Holy Ghost 89 times. He's spoken of as the Spirit of Truth four times. There are approximately 20 different designations for the Holy Spirit in Scripture. But when we have a descriptive adjective added to the word Spirit, the one that is most frequently used is Holy. Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost. And that brought us back, as you recall, to where we had closed the session before on the holiness of God. The holiness of God. It is his principal character. It is the manner of life to which God has called us his people. Holiness is the principal character quality that reveals a life 
of genuine faith and a genuine life of walking in the Spirit. If you are walking in the Spirit, you will be walking a holy life. A life that is separated and set apart from the world, the flesh and the devil. A life that is set apart to God. A life that is focused on serving Him with every thought, with every breath of your body. Holiness. Today we move on in the names of God, part 11. This uh, past week, in fact, um, it was yesterday that I was having my personal devotions in the book of Jeremiah, and I came across a name of God that I had never noticed before. You know, things just jump out at you. <laughs> Having been doing this study, I suddenly realized, here's a name of God that I don't have in any of my lists that I've been compiling. Here's a name of God that I'd never noticed before. Here is that name. The portion of Jacob. You say, that's a name? Yes. In Jeremiah chapter 51, 19, God is contrasting himself to the pagans and to their idols. And here's what God says. Jeremiah 51, 19. The portion of Jacob is not like them, for he is the former of all things. And Israel is the rod of the inheritance of the Lord of hosts. His name. Interesting. The portion of Jacob is both the creator, that is the one who is the former of all things, and he is Yahweh Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts. Jacob, who is called Israel, is called the rod of his inheritance. And I began to ask myself the question, well, why does God choose to use the name Jacob here rather than Israel? God is here called the portion of Jacob. He's not like them, that is, the gods of the pagans. Why does God use Jacob instead of using the name Israel, saying the portion of Israel is not like them? But he doesn't do that. He says, the portion of Jacob is not like them. Rather interesting, because God is within the context here, reminding the physical descendants of Jacob that they have special promises and a special position with the one who is the creator and with the one who is called the Lord of armies, the Lord of hosts, which we have studied already. You recall our studies in Genesis where we paid special attention to all the times in the Bible where it speaks of Jacob by the name Jacob even after God changed his name to Israel. It was those times when Jacob was not walking by faith. <laughs> and so God reminds him of that by calling him Jacob instead of calling him Israel. It was those times when he was out of fellowship. It was those times that he was doubting. It was those times when he was questioning and so God here in this context speaks of himself as the portion of Jacob is not like all those pagan gods and pagan idols. Well, I just wanted to share that with you. I haven't had lots of time to think about it, but those are the things that jumped out at me as I was reading through the book of Jeremiah and studying it chapter by chapter. The portion of Jacob, the former of all things, the Lord of hosts. <laughs> Three names for God in that same verse, and all equated with each other. Now today we want to begin a brief overview of the compound names of God that reveal the intensity of his character. The name Elohim is used in compound with other words three times or three different ways. There are three different names of God connecting Elohim to something else. There are seven different names of God whereby the name Jehovah is connected to something else in a compound form. So you will find three, which I think gives us a beautiful picture of the Trinity, and we'll see that as we go through those three different names. And you have seven, which is the number of completion, the number of perfection, whereby we find the compound names of God, where Jehovah, or Yahweh, is compounded with another word. The first name that we look at today is El Shaddai. It's translated Almighty God in Genesis 17.1. Rather interesting because this is the revelation of God who gives the covenant to Abraham. I'm going to read the passage for you so that you will understand its connection to the covenants that God makes with Abraham. 
El Shaddai, translated Almighty God. And we'll discover as we look at that name in other portions of scripture, that is not only the covenant God, but that is the nurturing God, the God that is taking care of an infant and providing everything that the infant needs. Raising that infant to a point of maturity. Now I gave you a hint just a few minutes ago of the point whereby the infant comes to maturity. A place where God suddenly says, you used to know me by these names here, but I'm going to let you know me by this name. We'll see that, the Lord willing, in a few moments. Genesis chapter 17. Abraham waits a long time for this. When Abram was 90 years old and 9, he's 99, not quite 100, 99, older than any of us in here, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God, that is, El Shaddai. I am El Shaddai. Walk before me, and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall my, thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be called Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. This is the first place that God reveals himself by that name. And this is the point at which God changes the name of Abram to Abraham. This is a point where God is restating the covenant that he had made for the first time with Abram back in Genesis chapter 12. Genesis 12, 1 through 3 is the first statement of the Abrahamic covenant. We find it again in Genesis chapter 15. We find it again in Genesis chapter 17. We find it again in Genesis chapter 21 and in Genesis chapter 22. God restating his covenant with Abraham. But here at this point, God is telling Abraham that he's going to have a new name. And he's going to give him something else as a sign of that covenant. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be called Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee, and I will make thee exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations out of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant. This is not a terminable covenant. It is an everlasting covenant. It is not a temporary covenant. It is not a conditional covenant. It is a permanent covenant, an everlasting covenant, to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee, so we're talking about the same group of people, the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, so we don't mistake it for something else. For an everlasting possession, that's not terminable, that's something that is permanent, and I will be their God. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore, thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Now here he gives him the sign of the covenant. Of the covenant where he changed his name from, Abraham, uh, from Abram to Abraham. This is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man-child among you shall be circumcised. And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant between me and you. And he that is of eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man-child in your generations. He that is born in the house, or bought with money of any stranger, which is not of thy seed, he that is born in thy house and he that is bought with thy money must needs be circumcised and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. God made a covenant with the Jews that is supposed to be always demonstrated physically through the rite of circumcision. And the uncircumcised man-child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. Say a baby of eight days old broke the covenant. If his parents didn't circumcise him, he was to be cut off. That's another euphemism for killed. 
God was very serious with Abraham. God, at one point, almost kills Abraham. Uh, Moses, because he has failed to keep this covenant with one of his children. We'll see that later in the book of Exodus. God has a very special, unique relationship with those who are physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that was to be the sign that they were related to this God here in this passage. When Abram gets his name changed from Abram to Abraham. Two things to notice in this passage. Number one, this is the first occurrence of the name El Shaddai, Almighty God in the Bible. Whenever you have a first occurrence of one of the names of God, it is significant and it establishes a pattern for later occurrences. Number two, circumcision is a sign of the Abrahamic covenant for national Israel, whom God still has future blessings for, and it's a sign that for national Israel has never changed. We find another very interesting use of the name El Shaddai in Ezekiel chapter 10 verse 5. Now you know the vision of Ezekiel is very complex, has many different parts to it. It goes all the way from the days of Ezekiel and from things that related to the destruction of the temple all the way down to the establishment of the millennial temple and the things that are going to be divided in the land between the tribes of Israel and the portion of the land where Messiah the Prince will have a special division as you get to the end of that book. It includes things that deal with the battle of Gog and Magog. It deals with things that occur during the tribulation period. Ezekiel has many different things, but in chapter 10, we find this verse, verse 5. And the sound of the cherubim's wings was heard even to the outer court as the voice of the Almighty God when he speaketh. That's El Shaddai. God speaking from the Holy of Holies in the temple and the rustling of the wings of the cherubim is heard. We've already seen in, in Isaiah chapter 6 who the one is that is the throne sitter who speaks to Isaiah. And the voice of the seraphim crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. There is no man that has that glory. That is the glory that extends from the one who sits on the throne. And it rustles the wings of the cherubim so that that rustling is even heard as he speaks. Usually the name El Shaddai is translated as God Almighty rather than Almighty God. The only two places we find it translated Almighty God are those two passages I just read for you. But we find it on multiple occasions translated as God Almighty. In Genesis chapter 28, And God Almighty bless thee and make thee fruitful and multiply thee, that thou mayest be a multitude of people. The blessing of God in terms of extended generations, children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. God is a nurturing God. God portrays himself, and we'll see this more clearly in a few more verses, as a loving Heavenly Father, one who meets the needs of his children, one who wants to see the generations grow. It's a beautiful picture here. The blessing is to be fruitful and to multiply not like we have here in the United States of America, where children are considered a bother and a curse and an expense, and we'd rather live without them, or if we have any, just have the very minimum and just you know, get them out as soon as we possibly can. All the way from the beginning of creation until now, God sees children as a blessing. Never forget that. Genesis thirty-five eleven, and God said unto him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins. Again, the picture is given to us seven chapters later that this is a blessing of children. This is the God who blesses those who want children. Genesis forty three fourteen. Here we find it again, eight chapters later, and God Almighty, that's El Shaddai, give you mercy before the man 
This is Jacob sending his sons back to Egypt. God Almighty give you mercy before the man that he may send away your other brother and Benjamin. If I be bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. Simeon has been taken captive on that first little journey down there. He's been put in prison. They come back, they use up the food that they got while Simeon languishes in Joseph's prison. And Jacob says, okay, time to go back and buy more food. And they said, we can't go back unless we take Benjamin with us. And Jacob says, I don't want to send Benjamin back. I've already lost the first son by my favorite wife. I'm not going to lose the second and last son by my favorite wife. I'm not going to send Benjamin. They said, then I'm going to starve to death. So what do you want? And so finally he agrees. Rather than losing them all through starvation, he will send Benjamin back with them to Egypt. And who is the God upon whom he calls? Who is the one that he blesses them with this name? It is El Shaddai. God Almighty, El Shaddai, give you mercy before the man that he may send away your other brother and Benjamin. If I be bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. He calls on God, the one who has cared for him, who revealed himself to his grandfather Abraham as El Shaddai, the God who makes the covenant and then provides for those little infants so that they can grow to maturity. It's a beautiful picture of our Heavenly Father. We find it used one more time in the book of Genesis. We find it in the prophetic blessings that Jacob gives to his 12 sons on his deathbed. It is used in the blessing of only one, only one, of those 12 sons. Different names for God are used in relation to the other sons, but the name El Shaddai is used in relation to only one son. It connects us back to five chapters earlier where Jacob is sending them back with Benjamin to the man whom he doesn't yet know is Joseph. Who is it? Jacob said unto Joseph, God Almighty, El Shaddai, appeared unto me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me. It's incredible. This is the name of God by which he was known to Israel in its infancy, the name upon which they called the one who is meeting their needs as the little teeny kids, the children, El Shaddai. Now I want to share with you the key verse that I mentioned a few moments ago. And this key verse is in the context of God sending Moses to Pharaoh, just like our text in chapter 3. And we're going to discuss it more when we get to Exodus 6. But this is three chapters later from our, from our text for the morning. It's Exodus 3, excuse me, verse 3, chapter 6, verse 3. God is speaking, and he says to Moses, And I appeared unto Abraham, and unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of El Shaddai, God Almighty. So we know we're talking about the same name that we've been discussing in these former passages. God says, I've appeared, he's talking to Moses, I appeared to Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name El Shaddai, God Almighty. Now listen to the last half of the verse. But by my name Jehovah was I not known to them. Now they had head knowledge of that name. It was a name that had been revealed. But God says here, the name that they really knew me by was El Shaddai. But they didn't really know me by the name Jehovah, Yahweh. And this is the name by which from now on they are going to know me. God chose to use that name for himself when the nation of Israel was in its infancy, El Shaddai, at the beginning of the Abrahamic covenant. But now as God forms Israel into a mighty nation and delivers them with a strong hand out of Egypt, 
He causes them to know him by his name, Yahweh. It's at the beginning of the law. It's at the establishment of the Mosaic Covenant. The word know in scripture has deep impact and meaning. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob didn't know me really by this name. They knew me by El Shaddai. Think back to the opening chapters of Genesis. Adam knew his wife, Eve, and she conceived. It is a close, intimate, personal knowledge that God is going to let them understand his character. His character increased in their knowledge, revealed, experienced in their knowledge and not merely in their head. The Almighty. Sometimes El Shaddai is not translated as Almighty God or God Almighty. It's translated merely by the word, the Almighty. That is the principal name of God used in the book of Job and portrays God as a nurturing father who shows his love. Listen carefully. A nurturing God who shows his love through discipline. Rather interesting when we find this name in the book of Job. We'll talk about that in a moment. We find it is again the prophetic patriarchal blessing of Jacob and as we said, the only occurrence in the prophetic blessings where we see the Almighty, not God Almighty or Almighty God, simply translated as the Almighty. Again, related to Joseph. Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well whose branches run over the wall. The archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him. But his bow abode in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. Verse 25. Even the God of thy father, who shall help thee, by the Almighty, that's El Shaddai, who shall bless thee with the blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lieth under, blessings of the breast, Blessings of the womb. The blessings of thy fathers have prevailed above the blessings of my progenitors under the utmost bounds of the everlasting hills. They shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him that was separate from his brethren. Joseph gets some incredible blessings here. And they are prophetic blessings. And they are blessings that will be literally fulfilled. The one who is El Shaddai watching over Joseph, even in his captivity, a man who was faithful and who later had no hatred or bitterness, but when his brothers came and said, you know, before Dad died, he told us to tell you not to hurt us. And Joseph says, am I in the place of God? God meant it unto you for good. You meant it unto me for evil, but God meant it for good, to bring alive as it is this day much souls. He understood the sovereign working of God in sufferings. We'll see that that's key to the book of Job also. The sovereign working of God in sufferings. El Shaddai is the God who provides for us in those times of suffering. And has a purpose in it and has a plan in it. And fulfills it for his own glory. We find that name El Shaddai translated the almighty is used several other places, very interesting places in Scripture. We find Balaam uses that name for God. In Numbers 24, verses 4 and 16, he has said, which heard the words of God, which saw the visions of the Almighty, El Shaddai, falling into a trance but having his eyes open. And the next six verses, or ten verses later, he hath said, which heard the words of God, and knew the knowledge of the Most High, which saw the vision of the Almighty, falling into a trance, but having his eyes open. Balaam understood who God was as he had revealed himself to Abraham. Balaam tried to walk away from him to make money. Balaam, in the end, blesses Israel rather than cursing Israel because God has blessed Israel because he is El Shaddai, the nurturing, caring God who will take care of his people. Balaam does get his money in the end. He gives to Balak, the king of Moab, the plan whereby 
They send down all their pretty girls who fornicate with the Israeli young men and God comes down and kills a bunch of them. Balaam gets paid. Several months later, Israel invades the land. And Numbers specifically notes for us, Balaam, the son of Basor, they slew with the sword. Dear people, don't be like Esau who sold his birthright for a mess of pottage. Don't be like Balaam who knew who the true God was and decided he would rather have money. It is not worth it. We find it also used very interestingly in the book of Ruth. Naomi speaks of God this way. In Ruth, verse 20 of chapter 1, And she said unto them, Call me not Naomi, which means pleasant. Call me Mara, which means bitter. For El Shaddai, the Almighty, hath dealt very bitterly with me. She knew the covenant promises of God. She knew the promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. She knew all the blessings that God had for those who were walking in fellowship, and she had just returned she had just returned from having left the land with her husband and her two sons, and she lost all three of them to death because God had told them to remain in the land and he would provide. He is a nurturing father. He's one who meets our needs. But they had left, and now she comes back, and she understands that the hand of discipline has been upon her. But you know, as we look at the book of Ruth, a loving father who disciplines always brings blessing in the end. And what is the blessing we find at the end of the book of Ruth? It is a child, an ancestor of David, an ancestor of the Messiah. We find her using that term bitterly once again in Ruth one twenty one. I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call ye me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the almighty El Shaddai hath afflicted me? Suffering, affliction, God sometimes does it because of our sin and disobedience. But sometimes God has other purposes in discipline. And we see that in the book of Job. Shaddai is used 31 times out of all 46 times that the Old Testament uses it. In other words, Shaddai is used more than two-thirds of the time it is found in Scripture in the book of Job. Discipline is not merely for doing wrong, but for proving the nature and character of God and then for getting us to trust Him. Not just for material prosperity, but to trust Him. Job 5.17 says, Bless, behold, happy is the man whom God correcteth. Therefore despise not thou the chastening of the Almighty, El Shaddai. Despise not the chastening of the one who is known by that magnificent name, El Shaddai. Job uses that name 31 times out of the 46 times that it's used in the Bible. You know, that verse is quoted in the book of Hebrews. That reminds us that we have a relationship to El Shaddai as well. Job wrote, Behold, happy is the man whom God correcteth, therefore despise not thou the chastening of the Almighty. Hebrews 12, 5 through 7 says, And have ye forgotten the exhortation, which speaketh unto you as unto children? My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord. That's El Shaddai in Hebrew in the book of Job. Nor faint when thou art rebuked of him, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? The nurturing father, the father who really loves his children, the father who cares about his children, the father who provides for his children, is a father who disciplines his children so that they will walk in holiness and in the ways of the Lord. Because that is the way God deals with us who are his children. Happy is the man whom God correcteth, therefore despise not thou the chastening of El Shaddai. That's important for us to remember when we're going through difficult times where there seems to be no apparent reason for the suffering. We all know Romans 8.28. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Did you know that the context of that 
is the suffering of believers. We, we sort of use it as a general blanket thing, but the context is suffering. Listen to verses 14 through 18. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again unto fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So we know we're talking about believers here. We know we're talking about the elect. We know we're talking about those who have been called, those who have been brought into the family. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Now, listen to verse 17 and 18. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we also may be glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Suffering before glory. Suffering before glory. You all know the athletic saying, no pain, no gain. <laughs> oh, how it hurts when you are doing the push-ups and the sit-ups when you're doing all the barbells and when you are running around the track, when you're doing all the things that are necessary to get in shape for the big competition. And then the day comes and you begin to run and your lungs are burning and your muscles are hurting and you can't stand the pain and you think you're going to collapse on the track and you hear the person right behind you panting away and he doesn't seem to be panting as hard as you are and he's gaining on you and you put more into it and you put more into it until you've given it everything you've got and you cross the finish line. They're suffering. But then there comes the dais, the victor's stand and your name is called and you go to the top of the stand and they place the gold medal around your neck. That's the glory. That's the context of Romans 8, 28. That's what we see taking place in the book of Job, though he does not understand it, until the last chapters where finally God speaks to Job out of the whirlwind. And Job repents. Dear people, how often we complain about what God is doing in our lives. Remember, suffering precedes glory. The pain precedes the reward. This is El Shaddai, Almighty God, the nursing, disciplinary Father God, working in the lives of his children through suffering to bring them to maturity to bring them to heavenly rewards in glory when they win their race of life. But we see Jesus, Hebrews 2, 9 and 10. But we see Jesus who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor. Suffering of death, the suffering proceeds. Crowned with glory and and honor. But not only he, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man, for it became him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect. What are the last two words? Through suffering. Suffering before glory. El Shaddai, the God who will bring his children from their infancy when he calls them, through the trials and tasks of life, though difficult and grim for us we feel, until finally we with Christ are in heaven and we get our rewards of glory. It's a beautiful name of God, the Nurturing Father, the one who does not let his children give up. The one who is with them all the way through their race in life.
the one who encourages them, motivates them, gives them their assigned workouts, and sees to it that the workout gets done so that he might bring them safely across the finish line to receive their rewards in glory. That is our God. He's portrayed that way in the book of Hebrews. Quoting Job, portrayed that way in the book of Romans, explaining to us our suffering and our glorification. He's the God who will help you through those times when you're in pressure, when you're under immense pressure, when you think you cannot go on any longer, when you feel like you're at the point of exhaustion, when you feel like you have too much pain in your life. You have a Heavenly Father who is giving you the strength, who is motivating you, and who is directing you till you can cross the finish line and receive the reward of glory. Amen. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you that you revealed yourself to Abraham as El Shaddai. Almighty God, truly, but Almighty God, who, as you have that name used of yourself, is the God who is the nurturing Father, the disciplinary Father, the Father who disciplines us not merely because of sin, though you do that, but who also gives us the discipline of one who wants to see us succeed, one who wants to see us excel, one who wants to see us fulfill the maximum potential that you have built into each one of us for the glory of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that we will lift up the feeble hands and quit having our knees knocked together as we run the race of life to which you have called us. Help us to remember that whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. Therefore, let us not despise the chastening of El Shaddai because it is designed for our good. It is part of those all things that work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose, not our purposes, his purpose. Help us to be excited and energetic about the discipline of life that you give to us so that we might indeed be strong athletes who fulfill the purposes that you, our heavenly coach, has called us to and to cross the finish line with victory. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.